respectueusement vous poser une question qui vous concerne personnellement, directement. Comment vous portez-vous Je vais vous répondre tout de suite. Je ne vais pas mal, mais rassurez-vous, un jour, je ne manquerai pas de mourir. Allons, enfants de la patrie, le jour de gloire est arrivé. Nous allons observer une minute de silence en hommage à la mémoire du général de Gaulle dont le nom est déjà inscrit dans vos livres d'histoire. Une minute de silence. En 1940, de Gaulle a sauvé l'honneur. En 1944, il nous a conduits à la libération et à la victoire. En 1958, il nous a épargné la guerre civile. Il a donné à la France actuelle ses institutions, son indépendance, sa place dans le monde. Française, Français, le général de Gaulle est mort. La France est veuve. A widow, after the 9th of November 1970. A stunned and tearful widow, whose grief seems to be shared around the world. France is a widow, granted. And yet the divorce had been signed for a good 18 months already. After a tumultuous romance lasting several decades, and somewhat worn out by an aging and overbearing pater familias, France had repudiated Charles. Before honoring him with two funerals on November the 12th, 1970. A mass in Paris for the world's dignitaries and several tens of thousands of Parisians. And a burial elsewhere, reserved for his family, his comrades, and a part of the population not yet qualified as downstairs France, the common people. The final days of Charles de Gaulle is the story of a brutal forced retirement, punctuated by reflections on the past, and a determination, despite everything, to continue to exist and to leave his mark on history. How many wounds does it take for a giant to fall? It would take just two for de Gaulle to die his first death. In the autumn of his days, the first blow came with the month of May that exploded in a fury of protest and demands. It is 1968. De Gaulle and a whole political class still clings to a grand epic vision, but another part of France wants to move into a new era. His legend would little by little diminish in the eyes of the French. His natural authority dwindled. It had been undermined by the left and would be defied by the crowds of young people and so he felt challenged. De Gaulle falters in May 68, but believes he can come back with the new springtime. He decides to defy the country's defiance and sets the date for April 28, 1969, a final political coup against a part of the country that had created its own version the year before of Is Paris Burning? Si je suis désavoué par une majorité d'entre vous, Ma tâche actuelle de chef de l'État deviendra évidemment impossible et je cesserai aussitôt d'exercer mes fonctions. Oui, 10 669 015. Non, 11 966 550. Le projet de loi référendaire n'est pas adopté. Dépêche AFP, le général de Gaulle communique, je cesse d'exercer mes fonctions de président de la République. Cette décision prend effet aujourd'hui à midi. 
Many of those who were close to him and in his family thought, of course, that he'd been killed, in quotes, by the failed referendum and by the fact that the French people had rejected him. He was cut to the quick by the circumstances of his departure. Between 1968 and his death, it was like a ship sinking. He had always said about other people that old age was a shipwreck. And for him it was particularly humiliating. De Gaulle was forgotten, that's all. And that was the worst about that period. De Gaulle was a shadow of the past. After his resignation, de Gaulle apparently said, I have to leave because the French people have grown tired of me. And I myself have grown tired of the French people. I no longer owe them a thing. He leaves the Republic for the realm of oblivion and heads for La Boisserie, a property he bought in 1934 at Colombelli des Eglises. He has but 600 days to live, when moments last for minutes or hours, and hours drag on for days, days, for weeks. In this small village in Champagne, halfway between Paris and the German border, he and his family had always sought to protect their privacy. Just a few days after resigning, the general summons Louis Blanc, a diplomat and former official at the Elysee Palace. The retired hero has decided to write his memoirs. He was at Colombe from April 27th onwards. During the following 48 hours, he received visits from his general secretary, Bernard Trico, who's dead now, and Xavier de la Chevalerie, his chief of staff, who's also dead. And he told Xavier de Chevalerie, if Blanc is not leaving on a mission, tell him I need him for my memoirs. So, when the general says, if Blanc isn't leaving on a mission, then that means Blanc isn't leaving on a mission. So I immediately told La Chevalerie, you can tell the general that I'm not leaving on a mission. And then, very rapidly, as of mid-May, he started sending me requests for various documents. He needed that because there were no archives at Colombe. To start with, he perhaps thought that he would still be called back. And then gradually the cloak of oblivion slipped over him somewhat. And he very quickly got that idea out of his head. He saw himself as becoming an ordinary citizen again. So he withdrew, back to the base camp, as it were, to his property at Colombe les Deux Églises, with Madame de Gaulle. And they planned to do what any ordinary people would do, that is to travel. They envisaged a change of scene somewhere. And so suddenly, without warning, de Gaulle leaves Colombe. On May 10, 1969, at 7 o'clock in the morning, Yvonne de Gaulle announces to the staff at the house, pack up the bags, we're leaving for Ireland. Why does de Gaulle decide to leave two weeks after the failed referendum vote when the writing of his memoirs appears to be so urgent. The general never liked the 18th of June. It was no secret to anyone. He'd always said, I'm not the man of a single day. He didn't want people to call him the man of June 18th. It was an expression that he hated. And he thought that being out of France on June 18th would prevent any kind of belligerent, rebellious or seditious remarks being made by anyone who might have had such intentions. One way, perhaps, of once again making the news, of saying in his own way, bugger it. Painfully aware that the great moments in history are accompanied by bitterly down-to-earth realities. And so it was with the famous broadcast of June 18th, 1940, urging France not to accept submission. The BBC provided a microphone in their airwaves, routinely noting the event in their records. De Gaulle speaks on behalf of a France that refuses to lie down and die, the momentous occasion confined to a dusty archive document. Name of speaker. General de Gaulle. Title or subject. France will continue the struggle. Date. June 18, 1940. Time. 10 p.m. Remarks. Duration, four minutes, no payment. 
The general was rather stunned by the failure of the referendum. He was deeply saddened, overcome by a profound sorrow. He left, as you know, like an injured animal, to lick his wounds outside of France. You must remember those photographs of the general, in his great black coat, with his cane, walking on the beach in Ireland. Why choose Ireland? Because, as he said, he didn't want to die before discovering that country. It is also an opportunity to re-establish a distant Irish connection, with ancestors on his mother's side, the McCartans, lords of Kinalati, veterans of age-old rebellion against the English colonialists. The general also loved Ireland because it had resisted England, it had detached itself from England and won independence from the English. This naturally appealed to him. L'hôtel Coveron, où est descendu le général de Gaulle et Madame de Gaulle, est inapprochable par les terres. Nous avons donc été obligés de prendre une barque pour nous approcher de ce petit hôtel, un hôtel d'une étoile. Hôtel modeste, les prix varient pour une personne, une chambre d'une personne, entre 16 francs et 24 francs, chambre et petit déjeuner. Euh, évidemment, vous voyez là une barque de police, nous, sommes, nous avons toujours un Saint-Bernard qui nous suit, même lorsque nous sommes à pied. Et je dois dire que les, les policiers ne veulent pas que l'on franchisse une, une certaine limite. Some of those who followed the trip to Ireland talked about the general, listening to a tiny transistor radio which belonged to Mr. Bittar, a Frenchman who worked at the embassy in Ireland. So there's the general, with this little transistor radio, listening to the news coming from France. It was extraordinary. The great man, who had been in power, with a simple radio, listening to the news from his country, a country he had just disowned in some way. Le maire de Colombelle et deux églises n'a pu cette fois saluer le général de Gaulle qui a voté par procuration. Monsieur Pompidou, très largement en tête de ce balotage, déclarait aussitôt les résultats connus. Ma première pensée sera pour les électeurs et les électrices qui m'ont apporté massivement leur voix. Ma seconde pensée, vous ne vous en étonnerez point, sera pour le général de Gaulle qui doit se féliciter que la France n'ait pas choisi la voie de l'impuissance et du retour au passé. Georges Pompidou was elected on June 15, 1969. De Gaulle would stay in Ireland for just a few more days. But on June 17 at 5 p.m., he has an appointment with another rebel. The former leader of the Free French is received by a former head of the Irish insurrection, Eamon de Valera. A symbolic meeting between two men who know full well the price of bloodshed, of intransigence and compromise, loyalty and betrayal. He liked Valera, a man like himself who had been the great hero of national independence. It was a fine sight seeing the general and de Valera. Valera was blind and the general didn't see too well at that time either. Valera was by his side and I saw them. Both walking past in the garden, it was very moving. Above all, they talked about Ireland in Europe. It didn't really go any further than that. Toasts were made, but there weren't any startling announcements or revelations that emerged from the meeting. They were simply making contact, they were happy to meet, and there were no direct consequences. In any case, the general didn't want to be involved politically. He was out of power, and certain things were drifting away from him. Various aspects of his life were fading away from him. The same evening after dinner, de Gaulle was moved to say, at this grave moment of my long life, I have found here what I was looking for, to face myself. He then added to Eamon de Valera, your work has been of great national service. I myself have also tried to be of great national service. In the twilight of their years, two paths that ended, not without a certain bitterness. 
For one, rejection by the French people. For the other, an amputated island with Ulster remaining in British hands. Northern Ireland was the home of de Gaulle's ancestors, now ravaged by the conflict between Catholics and Protestants. But the general apparently thought of making a visit. He thought about going to Northern Ireland. He considered that, but he was dissuaded from doing so. He mentioned he wanted to go to Northern Ireland in speaking to various people, but they dissuaded him because in view of the situation, it wasn't really politically correct. In other words, a visit by de Gaulle to Northern Ireland could have been a major diplomatic incident. A concern not necessarily unjustified. On June 19th, at a final reception, just a few hours before leaving for France, he proposed a toast. I raise my glass to Ireland in its entirety. The trip had lasted six weeks. On June 19th, the Irish landscapes were replaced by the countryside of eastern France, and de Gaulle returned to Colombey. From now on, his life would continue almost exclusively at La Boisserie, with strict day-to-day -day routines, rigid schedules, and one ultimate aim, his memoirs. I saw him at Colombey for the first time at the beginning of July. And he was just the same as always, very regal and composed, very kind, extremely pleasant, and keen to work on the publication of his speeches and on writing his memoirs. One had the impression this was a man who had been hurt, but who had regained a certain balance and was ready to get down to work. I arrived and it was announced to the general, Blanc is here. And at the appointed time, the office door opened and I went in. We stopped at one o'clock and he would leave the office and turn the television on. When there were guests, drinks would be served. In fact, it was often me who served the drinks. He asked me to serve the drinks, and then we sat down at the table. We didn't stay at the table for long, and we'd get up and move into the living room, where we'd have coffee and a pousse café, a liquor. And it was me that served the general with this liquor. It was all very organized, always at the same time, very punctual. If I was alone, we'd have coffee, and immediately afterwards, we'd get back to work again, which I wasn't too pleased about, because after a meal, I quite like to take a nap even if it's only for five minutes. But there was no question of that with him, so we'd go back to work. Two or three months after he retired to Colombay, and after the trip to Ireland, I went to see a Cuv de Merville, not for any particular reason, or perhaps simply to see him, because he was someone I admired and liked very much. Perhaps, too, because he'd just come back from Colombay, so I went to see him and asked him, Mr. Prime Minister, in what state of mind do you find General de Gaulle? Deeply affected? In shock? And he said, not at all. I found a man who was happy. And why? Because he's doing what he loves. He's writing. Monsieur le curé de l'unique église de Colombay, les deux églises, a coutume de dire, ici, c'est un peu comme à Ars. Il n'y a rien à voir, mais on vient tout de même. Colombay, ce serait plutôt le lourd du gaullisme. Le commerce local, en l'occurrence surtout le café tabac de Janine, bénéficie quelque peu de cet apport de devises intérieures et parfois étrangères. C'est dans cette boutique que nous vous conseillons d'aller pour avoir la meilleure vue de la boisserie. Le président de la République est visible le dimanche à 11h30 dans l'église où Monsieur et Madame de Gaulle ont leur prix Dieu et où les fidèles feignent de ne pas remarquer leur présence. 
There were two General de Gaulle's. There was the General de Gaulle of France, for whom nothing was too grand or too formidable, and then General de Gaulle, the simple citizen who wanted to live like everyone else, peacefully and simply. In fact, the general was very, very simple in his everyday life. We didn't see him very often. He was at home and he didn't go out much, just occasionally. Madame de Gaulle, of course, would go out shopping. For us, he was just a local inhabitant like anyone else, except that he was certainly someone with a higher rank than us. But the man lived like we live. In winter, for food, if we were eating stew, then he ate stew like we did. He wasn't a man looking for anything else. No fuss. They were interested in village life like any ordinary citizens. In any case, even if we didn't see him very much, he knew what he was doing in the country. Do you still see him as a great man today? Yes, more than certain politicians at the moment. De Gaulle writes his version of history, holed up in La Boisserie, condemned to watch the world going on without him, just another passive viewer religiously watching the nightly news on television. And what does he observe? The Americans getting increasingly bogged down in the bloody quagmire of the Vietnam War. The same Americans conquering space and reaching the moon. On July 16th, he watches the launch of Apollo 11, and on the 21st, the first moon landing. There is also one consolation, seeing his baby break the sound barrier as Concorde reaches Mach 1. But what does he feel when a new generation of unknown men start making their mark on history as the great figures of his own era disappear? In September, a coup d'etat in Libya brings a certain Colonel Gaddafi to power, while the same month sees the death of Ho Chi Minh. Uncle Ho, the former enemy, one of the leading protagonists in Uncle Sam's failure and the French defeat in Indochina, a man the general would have liked to meet to establish peace among the brave. Ho Chi Minh dies at the age of 79, the age of the retired General de Gaulle. Does he sometimes wonder when his hour will come, when and how death will strike? I don't think he was afraid of death. What bothered him about dying was that it stopped him from finishing his work. And despite everything, he had the feeling that something could happen to him. Something that I believe happened to his father, but I'm not sure and certainly to one of his brothers. And that is an aneurysmal rupture. He had the feeling that anything could happen to him at any moment. I think that affected him, and he always gave the impression of being in a hurry to finish what he wanted to do. He was always tormented. He was tormented about France. He lived only for France. He lived only for his country. He didn't want anyone to touch it, for it to be hurt. It's a simple image, but that's how it was. And so he suffered. He suffered permanently. He suffered from the fact that the French rejected him, it's true. And he suffered for two years, as Madame de Gaulle admitted. But he suffered a little less as time went by. With the healing effect of time, he little by little suffered a bit less. He buried himself in his memoirs, and writing was of great solace to him, of great moral support. De Gaulle writes, receives visits from his family and a few close friends, and takes long walks in the Douy Forest, not far from Colombey, one of his few activities outside La Boisserie. There are also a few rare moments shared with certain villagers. Uh, 
Mon grand-père était un grand mutilier de la guerre 14-18. My grandfather had been disabled in the 1418 war. And so, when he was going to church on Sunday, the general would stop by to visit my grandfather, who was paralyzed, and he would give him a cigarette. Well, he put a cigarette in his mouth and he lit it for him. And then they would talk for a bit. Because the general had a brother who was more or less in the same situation as my grandfather, disabled in the 1418 war. And so he was reminded of his brother. And anyway, just as a neighbor, he was happy to stop off and say hello to my grandfather. Do you think they talked about the Great War, the 1418 war? Oh, yes, certainly, yes. I'm sure they did. They were bound to be quite painful times to remember, but then it was still very much in people's minds at that time. He was a bourgeois from the north, who lived in quite a select and exclusive milieu from all points of view. I think his awareness of the nation and its very varied nature came from the 1418 war, which opened his eyes. Because he was a lieutenant, which means basically at the start of the war, he was relatively low ranked, and he was there mixing with the people of France, that is to say with agricultural workers, who made up the majority of the French population, and workmen, and he wasn't at all with the bourgeois folk from Lille. He was with what formed the French nation at that time, and he encountered the people of France and lived with them in the trenches. He was wounded at Domont, near Domont, during a German attack. He'd been left there unconscious, and a passing German soldier had even stabbed him with a bayonet. And I think that if he had known he was looking at the future General de Gaulle, that German soldier would have finished him off. And I think that even the doctors who treated him well in Germany, if they had known what the young Captain de Gaulle would become, perhaps they would have treated him differently. Neither wars nor assassination attempts would get the better of de Gaulle, who rejected all invitations to an early grave. But death is indifferent. It lurks in waiting, patiently observing the former head of state writing and contentedly dealing with mundane property affairs. We were in the final phase at reorganizing the workload, and I was about to come into possession of some land. And I wanted to make an agreement with him about what should be done or not on the land. And so I asked to meet him. It was the 15th of April, 1970. I asked to meet him through a chauffeur. The chauffeur went to ask the general and to show that you didn't just walk into La Boisserie as easily as that. Even if I was from Colombe, the general asked for what reason I wanted to see him. The night before, I didn't sleep a wink. I didn't know how I was going to cope in the interview with the general. I was 23 at the time. I had my school leaving certificate, that was all. I didn't know what I was going to say, and as it was me that had asked for the audience, it was up for me to talk first. But the general put me at ease right away. He was very accommodating. He offered me a cigarette and gave me a glass of Mirabelle, and he asked what I wanted. I explained why I'd come. He replied right away, and we reached an agreement. Once we agreed, and the interview lasted two or three minutes at most, I didn't know what to do. I was panicking. But he got up and he said to me, I shall leave you, Monsieur Pio. So I stood up and there was the packet of cigarettes that he'd left just in front of me and I automatically picked it up and put it in my pocket. When I realized what I'd done, I took it out and put it back on the table and the general saw it and he smiled. And that was all. On leaving La Boisserie on April 25, 1970, René Pio does not suspect the two men will meet again in a few months, for the very last time. A few weeks later, the general sets off for one of his final encounters with history. 
not with the imminent and dreaded anniversary of the 18th of June, but abroad. Still in the midst of his memoirs, he decides to leave France for a final escapade. On June 3rd, the de Gaulle's leave Colombay and head for Spain. Spain was a country that was made for him, a country with harsh landscapes and bare desert plains. On June 18, 1970, he visited an extraordinary place, a little Spanish village about 20 or 30 kilometers from Marbella called Ohen. He was staying at a hotel that was a small refuge for wild goat hunters. He worked all day and only went out in the evening, when it was cool, because it was pretty hot in Andalusia. And he was pleased not to be subjected to the honors of June 18th. The day he was no longer in power, when he became a free man again, he wanted to see Spain, the land of Charles V, historical Spain, and of course he wanted to see General Franco, for whom, whatever my father and many others might say, he perhaps had a secret esteem. Franco was an enigma to him. He wondered how Franco had lasted in his country, what he'd been able to do, how he held on, etc. It was an enigma to him. Curiously, as de Gaulle gradually no longer represented a threat to those in power, and with the respect he aroused, and the fact that for many people he no longer really counted, this visit didn't really provoke the reactions one might have expected. For Malraux and Mauriac, a meeting with Franco obviously wasn't designed to please them. I believe Malraux made this more or less clear, and for Mauriac, it was something of an ordeal. Mauriac must have said, it's punishment for my sins. June 8, 1970, the Pardo Palace. The rather strange meeting takes place at midday in El Carillo's office. In private, or almost. A senior civil servant acts as interpreter. Joining de Gaulle and Franco is Maximo Cajal. I think that de Gaulle, from an intellectual point of view, was more solidly grounded, I might say. Franco had a voice that in Spanish we call Aflautada, quite high-pitched, not very pleasant, quite disagreeable. But then, his voice was his voice. So that was, I don't really know how to explain it. And then the way of talking. The general underlined what he was saying with his hands and arms, whereas Franco was much more passive. De Gaulle was also more curious, and Franco was quite moved. If one can talk about him having emotions, I'm not sure. Because for him, the very presence of De Gaulle was politically important. I don't know if we can say that it was a kind of a justification for his regime. Mm. But for him, it was something very positive. I had the impression he was a little disappointed by the man. He was perhaps expecting to see someone more prominent than what he saw. In human terms, I mean. What makes you say that? I don't know, from what he didn't say. He didn't make any very positive remarks about the man he met. He didn't say he was a very capable man, of great intelligence. He said nothing, just that he had found him to be somewhat lethargic. I can't remember the exact word he used. I can't remember the exact word he used. 
The interview came to an end, and at one point a door opened, and there was an adjutant who said, Your Excellency, lunch is served, something like that. And he got up and left, without even glancing at me. It ended like it began. <laughs> On June 27th, the de Gaulle's are back in Colombe. The next travel plans are for China. De Gaulle would like to meet Mao. Meanwhile, daily life goes on at La Boisserie, and the world, as usual, keeps turning, and great men disappear. On September 1st, a die-hard Gaullist, the writer Francois Mauriac, passes away. And on the 2nd, a companion from the Liberation, Field Marshal Koenig, who had restored a degree of France's honor at the Battle of Bir Hakem in 1942. On September 29th, the Egyptian president, Jamal Abdel Nasser, dies from a heart attack at the age of 59, a loss that affects de Gaulle, who had admired the rice. Consolation comes on November 4th, when Concorde reaches Mac 2. France is still one of the leading airborne powers, and de Gaulle must be in heaven. He has now but a few days to live. At a time when he triumphs once more, dragging himself out of the oblivion France had confined him to. Politics were no longer the issue. De Gaulle makes his comeback as an author. Notre seule consolation, pour faible qu'elle soit, sera d'avoir suggéré au général de Gaulle d'avancer la date de publication des Mémoires d'Espoir, qui était primitivement fixée au 20 novembre. 1970. Sans cela, l'écrivain Charles de Gaulle n'aurait pas assisté à la publication de son œuvre. Nous espérons lui avoir donné une joie dont nous ne pouvions pas imaginer qu'elle serait l'une des dernières. À un moment, on travaillait dans son bureau. Jean, Jean At one point, we were working in his office, sorte de and I heard a sort of whistling noise. Un oiseau qui, qui fait, qui and I thought. De, there must be a bird singing somewhere. And it was the general who was whistling. He was quite pleased with the work he'd done and the reception his memoirs had been given, which was substantial. That was the last time I spoke to him. The de Gaulle revival. But his literary success does not make him overlook his other preoccupations. On November 9th, he asked to see his neighbor, René Pio, again. After the refurnishing, the general had reclaimed everything around La Boiserie, which was quite normal, and so I became the general's farmhand. The general asked to see me. He didn't want a farmer anymore. That's why I went to see him the day he died. He invited me into his office to ask me to agree to cancel the lease between the two of us. I went to La Boisserie, and he was very talkative. I was in his office for 15, 20 minutes, and he asked me a lot of questions about our work, about the building we were constructing, my family, my children, everything. He was very chatty. And there was no sign he was going to die that very day. And as we were in the process of building stables for the animals, he said, it must be expensive building something like that. And he added, if you're in difficulty, I can help you. He said in so many words, the general is quite comfortable. But on the other hand, he didn't offer me a Mirabelle like the last time. And as he went out of his office, Madame de Gaulle, who was knitting the library next to the office, she remarked to him that he hadn't offered me anything. And the general was embarrassed and he said, Monsieur Pio, come and have a drink. But I said, no, thank you, general. And he accompanied me to the door and then I heard about his death the next morning. But meanwhile, to confirm the agreement we'd made together, he wrote a letter after our discussion. 
9 novembre 1970. Dear Monsieur Pio, after our agreement of today, I would ask of you to accept this as a token of your gracious cancellation of our lease. Yours most sincerely, Charles de Gaulle. One of his last written documents, to which de Gaulle adds a check, a generous gesture, one of his last with regard to other people. At about 7 p.m., the general sits down in the library for a game of patience. Suddenly, he puts his hand on his back and apparently says, it hurts, before collapsing. A priest and a doctor are immediately called for. Compte tenu de ses antécédents, je pensais qu'il pouvait faire un accident vasculaire cérébral aigu, un infarctus, et que j'aurais certainement des dispositions rapides à prendre, du style évacuation, etc. Je me suis précipité dans le, le salon, où le général était étendu sur un divan, encore vivant, mais inconscient. Dégueulant de sueur, agité, euh, ça signait euh, l'accident vasculaire aigu. Il est mort, donc, sous vos yeux. Il était en train de mourir quand je suis arrivé. Il y avait Madame de Gaulle, il y avait Marou, il y avait les deux servantes. Et il y a eu, d'un seul coup, comme euh, un silence. Il, quelque chose venait de, de, de s'écrouler, de s'effondrer. Et une heure après, je... One hour later, his chauffeur came to inform me of the death. It was a moment of great emotion, something of a catastrophe, and he died so suddenly. It was at that point with the chauffeur that we decided that I would go to La Boiserie the next morning at 7.30 to see about organizing the funeral, because obviously it was all top secret. Because we didn't really know where the admiral was, for example, so we needed time for him to be informed rather than him hearing about his father's death on the radio. General de Gaulle's heart stopped beating at about 7.30 p.m. And so began his last great rendezvous with the world. At the forefront of events was Colombay les deux églises. The village became a part of history, as did the general himself, when his death was officially announced on November 10th. I immediately called a council meeting, which was held at 1.30. Then at 2 p.m. we visited La Boiserie. And at 3 o'clock we met with the various authorities that we'd called in, the prefecture, the gendarmes, the local ministries, etc., in order to finalize the funeral, which was scheduled for two days later, on November 12th at 3 p.m. Captain Philippe de Gaulle had not seen his father for more than a month. Posted to Brest, he was informed the same evening and arrived in Colombay the next day in the afternoon of November 10th. I was in Brest, and I was actually surprised because for me, my father seemed to go on indefinitely, in history and for me, instinctively, and to find some connection with him. I looked for the physical characteristics which brought us together somehow. We were the same height, had the same size of head, and on the back of his head I looked for the same bump and found that too. And so I was looking for myself in some way, in my father and in myself. It was me who suggested to General de Boisieu that the general should be carried by young people. It seemed to me very symbolic and very fitting that the old general, old in quotes, should be carried by young people. It seemed to be right. So that was organized with 12 youngsters who would carry the general. 
We thought at first that people from the Saint Cyr military school would have the honor of carrying the general. For me, it was a great honor. He would walk past my parents' door every two weeks, and sometimes he would come and say hello to my parents. I was a bit nervous, though, because I was afraid of not doing it properly, particularly as I was the smallest and so I was in front. But it was an unforgettable day, and I'll always remember it. I was working at the time. I was head chef at Chaumont. It was my boss who told me, he said, the general's dead. And then a few hours later, my parents telephoned and told me, listen, you've been appointed to carry the general's coffin. And well, uh, it was a bit like with Gerard. The problem was my boss didn't want me to go, so I told him, look, I've already worked in several places, and I've always left on good terms. But if you refuse me this, you can have my apron back, because I can't say no to my family. They made us rehearse a bit beforehand so that we knew what to do, like our positions and what had to be done. It was in the church. We rehearsed in the church. Well, we needed a certain coordination between bringing the coffin out and putting it on the armored car. It all had to be fairly smooth and well organized, and we had to walk slowly. But in actual fact, it all came together, and I think it was the emotion that helped us all. We didn't make any false moves. I remember when we came out of the church to go to the cemetery and I got my left foot caught up with my right foot and I hit a step because there were steps leading into the cemetery. I was terrified of missing a step or falling or I don't know what. I didn't want to fall down. I would have looked really stupid. I had been warned that one of the youngsters had been bribed to take photographs when the body was to be collected. So I contacted the gendarmes, who were to get them all together. They rounded them up, and it was agreed that they would stop off at my house before going to La Boiserie to pick up the coffin. So they came to my house, and I saw them one after the other, of course, and I explained quite politely what was going on, and said that there would be no further consequences, even if one of them had the little camera in question, they should just tell me, and that would be the end of it. So they were all searched, and they weren't at all shocked, and nobody said anything afterwards. And then they got in the gendarme's bus, which took them directly to La Boiserie, and so everyone was relieved, because otherwise it would have been an extraordinary scandal, can you imagine? Photos taken at La Boiserie, with Madame de Gaulle and everything, at the moment the body was to be taken from the house, it would have been an unbearable scandal, and the mayor would have been caught up in the whole affair. It was the mayor of Colombey who was called by La Boiserie, and he took care of the organization. So he came here, and at the time it was my grandfather who ran the joinery, and the mayor came to see me about making a coffin. Very simple. A coffin for an ordinary person. He asked me for something quite plain. A coffin in oak, with no padding, just an inner lining, that was all and the handles and a crucifix. At the time I was a choir boy, and I had the honor and privilege of officiating at his funeral. Officiating as a choir boy, and I was to the right of Abbe Jujouet, so I had the coffin right opposite me with the Saint Sirens around it, and the family just opposite. And of this ceremony, I can remember pretty much every detail. There was a very special atmosphere. The village had been invaded. As you know, the village of Colombea is 400 inhabitants, and the village was invaded by a crowd of people, a tightly packed, dense crowd of people mourning, sad people. The atmosphere was very gloomy.
At the moment we put him in the ground, on the other side of the road to where his tomb is today, in the square there must have been hundreds of cameras. You couldn't see the crowd behind and they were clicking away non-stop. So that added to the particular atmosphere, because it's things like that you never forget. France had already buried him once. In some way, on the day of his death, it brought him back to life again. Despite his wishes for a funeral reserved for family, friends, former comrades, and the inhabitants of Colombay, a stately homage was also organized in Paris. La nuit et la pluie enveloppaient l'Arc de Triomphe lorsque des milliers d'hommes et de femmes se sont trouvés réunis dans une même pensée. Entre l'appel de juin 40 et ce jour de deuil national, tant d'événements retentissants ont marqué l'histoire de la France et la vie de Charles de Gaulle que sa légende ne pourra que se prolonger très loin dans l'avenir. To whom then does the last word belong? To the millions of pilgrims from around the world who filed past de Gaulle's tomb, out of mere curiosity, nostalgia, respect, or idolatry? Or to a complex and multifaceted character, determined to go down in history, who nursed so many ambitions for his country, yet fully realized the vanity of human affairs? Did he not write one day, quoting Nietzsche, nothing is worth anything? Nothing ever happens, and yet anything can happen, but that is immaterial. <laughs>